Okay, we've started the recording. Um, I am not going to break into a song and dance of Let's Go to the Movie, but I feel been humming that song, been humming that song all week. And um, today we're going to be talking about a year in the life of the Sanger Theater here in Pensacola, um, concentrating on the year 1930. And this research kind of grows out of a uh, a project where we got underway, which is kind of uh, going to help the folks at the Sanger celebrate their centennial in a couple of years and just seeing what we have in our collection. Um, as you can see from our first slide here, this is a beautiful uh, photograph of downtown Pensacola Palo Factory. Certainly, prob certainly probably 1930 or that period, especially since the sign since latest talking pictures. And I'll be coming back to that in my talk. But let's talk a little bit Let's talk a little bit about the history of the Sanger Theater. And it's a long history, and I don't want to get in, uh, use it all up today. But basically, in 1911, two brothers in Shreveport, Louisiana, Abe and Julian Sanger, which operated a drugstore, decided that they would make some more money and build a movie theater. And they built one, and they operated it as a vaudeville house for about a year. And then they decided they would exclusively show motion pictures uh, there. Um, they uh, created a, a company, they issued stock, set up a board of directors, and they called it the Sanger Amusement Company, and they began buying movie theaters in Texarkana, uh, Monroe, Louisiana, and other places in Louisiana, and uh, eventually expanded to, to quite a chain. Uh, quite a chain. Um, I will mention that in Pensacola, they uh, bought, the Isis, bought the Isis movie theater in 1914, and then the Bonita movie theater in 1915. Um, another conglomerate was called the Victenberg Inter Enterprise Amusement Enterprises, and uh, they had uh, they had they and Sanger bought the two movie theater from them. And in 1917, Sanger bought in Victenberg and became one conglomerate. And they talked about building a new theater in Pensacola. Now, before this time, the largest gathering place in Pensacola had been the Pensacola Opera House, which today, if it was still existing, it would be sitting uh, immediately north of the um, T.T. Wentworth Museum, the uh, uh, downtown building. Um, and that the, um, the Opera House was the largest place in Pensacola. It was severely damaged by a hurricane in 1916 and torn down in 1917. So as of 1917, there is no large gathering place in Pensacola. And the uh, Sanger organization decided to go ahead and build a new theater. Um, in a lot of towns, in many towns, they would have at least one theater that was the theater where new movies came, the biggest one in town, the grandest one. In New York, you'd call this an uptown theater as opposed to a downtown theater. And so they decided that they would bring, build a new theater devoted exclusively to the dramas of the day. It would have higher ticket prices. It would be much quality. And the ISIS would be, relate, be relegated to being a 10 cent theater, and the Bonita would be relegated to being a 5 cent theater. Now, clearly, the inter that's 1917, and clearly the interruption of the World War I to the country and economy had postponed any immediate work. But eventually, construction began on what was now the Sanger Theater on January 20th, 1924, being built at Florida's greatest show place. There were several other buildings on the site that had to be demolished, including a, another theater called the Pastime Theater. And they invested, the Brother Sanger organization invested four hundred to five hundred thousand dollars in the construction. And they also used some of the material from the old opera house, some of the bricks, uh, wrought iron and all in the Spanish style architecture. The seats were light gray. Uh, today they're red, but they were light gray at the time. And early on in the discussion, there was quite some, some discussion about combining the theater with building a hotel on the site, putting them both together. But those discussions fell through, and, and the other group eventually built the San Carlos Hotel in 1926. But today we're going to go a few years later, and we're going to use the year 1930. And why 1930? 
1930 was a major year for Sangley Theater. Um, and um, it's an interesting year because we had the stock market crash in 1929, and it's not quite impacting Pensacola yet. 1930 is, a, is an important year because of the changes in uh, the entertainment industry, moving pictures and all that. We're going to cover a little bit of that today. Um, and also I chose this, I chose this period because I thought it would be interesting to, to see what, what we had here and what was going on. Now, the, um, with the stock market crash, of course, um, there was the movie theater became an allure because they provided respite from everyday problems, providing singing, dancing, laughter, tears, romance, and even hope. And they also the movie changed because of the uh, cri crisis. They actually began adding more socially conscious dramas reflecting the flight of, of white color workers and adding funny films like Escape uh, Blue Ball comedies, musicals, and that kind of thing. Now, operating the Sangre Theater, basically there were three film, new films a week. Uh, the same feature, one feature was shown on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Then a new film came in for Friday and Saturday, and a new film came in for Sunday and Monday. This gave the audiences a reason to go to the theater on Friday and Sunday, and or even Saturday and Sunday, because they'd see a brand new film. The uh, theater opened at 11 o'clock. Admission was 25 cents from 11 to 1 o'clock. They were 40 cents from 1 o'clock to 6 o'clock. And from six to eleven, they were it was fifty cents, and children were ten cents. I could find no indication in any of my readings that how the theater operated, whether you cleared out the people so be between uh, at, at one o'clock. I don't think that happened, um, and they didn't come around and collect extra money. So eventually, if you got in eleven o'clock, you essentially could stay, could stay all day. Now, most films were multi-reels, and that is a film could not be shown in one sitting like we do today with the DVD or a CD. The film were broken up into reels, and so you had you had to you had to keep changing the reel. Uh, most of them, most of them were were uh, were multi-reels, and the Sanger, when it opened, had been shipped two projectors, so they could switch reel. There were also additional rip film like cartoon, newsreel, short comedy, and other kinds of thing. I found one instance in the newspaper where someone was talking about their conversation with their friend between reels of the movie. So obviously there were some, some breaks, some breaks in the thing. And you'll notice the sign, all talking, laughing, movie tone. And I will explain what that means in a minute. Now, frequently the Sanger would inc still include vaudeville or act between the movies since they were on the Sanger circuit. So January 1st, 1930 opened not only with a new movie, but also a midnight whoopee show. Whoopee show at 11.30 that evening. And that included Singer, a minstrel set, and also a showing of their next film, Street Girl, which actually that as a new film wouldn't occur till about two days later. Um, you will notice under the word Sanger, it says that one of the public theaters. Now, public theaters was a chain of some 1,100 movie theaters, and it was operated as a subsidiary of Paramount and the famous Lasky Corporation, who made the Paramount picture. And public bought out the Sanger Amusement Company in 1927. Uh, in Pensacola, the Isis Theater began using a public theater in their advertisement on October 13, 1929, and the Sanger began saying it was a public theater in their advertisement beginning October 29, 1929. So this is no longer a owned by the Sanger company, although most of the theaters kept the Sanger name. Sanger also called itself the home of Paramount Pictures. And Paramount Pictures were considered the top one of the top qualities in the movie industry, and so they often got many of the movies that just came out just within a week after the movie had been been released. 1930 opened with the film *The Cockeyed World*, and by this time, movie tone, Fox movie tone, had 
perfected the technique of putting sound on the film. So these were talkies, all talking with singing, laughing, music tracks, and sometimes still black and white, depending on the studio and the film, and occasionally silent with subtitles. So the lobby cards and the advertisements would all be in brilliant color, but the movies, of course, were black and white. Now, the term all talkies is important because some of the silent film did have talking sequences. And so you'd have a silent film, you might have a brief talking. So the, that all talking is telling everything out. The whole film has sound. Now, this film, Cockeyed World, it sounds very typical movie for a military town like Pensacola, two Marines sent to a South Sea island where they fight over the local island girl. And I'm sure it was it was well well received. And then two days later, the film Street Girl opened uh, for a two-day run. And you notice here the lobby card notes 100% dialogue. Again, emphasis being for the first time that these movies are all talking. There's all uh, they all have they have sound. And you're probably asking now, and, I'm, and I did make a list of all of the films shown at the Sanger in the year 1930. And no, I'm not going to be going over every film today. But I have a selection of them because they all are important because they bring Hollywood to Pensacola. They're the <laughs> things that the local people, Pensacola, are seeing uh, and learning about. So the next film that came to Pensacola on January 5th was called Pointed Heels. Now, and uh, Pointed Heels was advertised as having, I'll show you the next, move on to the next slide here. It starred William Powell and Fay Ray, and the plot was big name musical performers experienced everyday problems and disappointment during their off-stage hours as a musical comedy. And note it says it has two-tone technicolor sequences. This is an important development in film, for up to this point, most Pensacolians had not seen color in film. So we're setting up Pensacola and Sanger to introduce color to the movie. Now, getting color into the movies involved a number of processes, and one of them was called the two-color technicolor process. And this is an example of what audiences were seen. Now, Technicolor began using a two-color process in 1922, and by the 19, late 1920, 29 is widely used. They would later, later develop their full color process in 1932. Um, and in 1932, what you would do is, in filming, you would produce three negative, one for each of the main colors, and then these would be combined in the final printing to get color. But at this time in 1930, they're using what is called two-color technicolor process. This is what a film slide would look like. And here's how that process was done. In short, the motion picture camera split the incoming image through a green filter and a red filter. This created alternating black and white negatives on a film. You can see that film strip one negative is vertical, the other is, is reverse. This is the same film. It's just being recorded twice on the film strip. They would take one of these and they would run it through the green color, more of a green color process. They would take the other, run it through the red color process. And then they would glue the two resulting films together so that in a movie projector, the light shone through both of them. And what you would get is something like this. It produced a, an image that it, it worked pretty good because for film, film tones and red hair and stuff like that, the red came out perfectly. The green would enhance grass and, and other green things. But other colors like yellow, purple, and blue, they're often very, very pale in these. They, they, they just, they just don't, don't show up at all. There are some other issues with the two with the two tone color process of gluing two negative back to back onto a reel, and sometimes they were a little out of sync. Sometimes the projector film bubbled, and that made them even worse out of sync. And so, actually, the Pointed Hill film was actually a black and white film, but had a couple of these color sequences. 
The next thing to hit the Sanger in January of 1930 was the touring company of the Vagabond King, a hundred member performer for one night only. This was a very successful uh, opera, operetta. It, it ran for 63 weeks in Casino Theater in New York, 32 weeks in Chicago, 76 weeks in London. And for as a result, there were several touring companies that used the main performer, company performer from the uh, from the theater. And for this was a live performance uh, on the stage at the Sanger on January 9th, 1930. And of course, the prices um, the prices, of course, reflect uh, some of that. With the price being three dollars, two fifty, two dollars, dollar fifty, seventy five cents. 50 cents in the gallery and so forth. And they also took, uh, amazingly, they would take checks and checks and cashier checks for, for these. Um, and it was a quite a successful, it was one night, one night only. The, um, the plot of the film was a story that took place in medieval France. A uh, man was, poet was sent to hang by the king who was writing bad verses about him. And he was postponed for 24 hours if he could defeat the invading Burgundians and win the love of the beautiful Catherine. Well, Pensacola audience who didn't know at the time it was already being turned into a movie. And so we will come back to that shortly. But well, there, while the audiences are enjoying the, 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 the operetta, um, most of the movies in the 1930s, I mean, there are a lot of original movies, but a lot of them were based on stage plays at the time, simply converted to a motion picture. Now, um, Penn Vicoli and Vaughn saw their favorite movie stars on the 1930 movie screen and, and radio heroes and heroines that they heard on the radio. And toward the end of the January, the love parade with Marie Chevalier and Jeanette McDonald showed up at the Sanger. Um, this was kind of surprised me because the film had only been released on January the 18th. So obviously the Sanger, uh, the Paramount, uh, uh, were getting their movies uh, to their to their showcases, to their theater really fast. This is the film debut of, Je debut of Jeanette McDonald. It was a huge box office hit. It, it was credited for actually saving Paramount Studio from bankruptcy after the stock market crash. It didn't hurt that you had the hands of Marie Chevalier in the film. It was also nominated for six Academy Awards. And the following week, the Sanger showed this film called Show of Show, produced by Warner Brothers. Now, this was a compilation film. In other words, if about, uh, if almost, it's 128 minutes long, and it's a compilation of various. Warner Brothers star, nearly everybody in the Warner Brothers studio doing something on the film, singing, performing, dancing, or whatever. If ever, if actually Warner Brothers fifth color film that they ever produced, but actually about 21 minutes of the first reel are black and white, and four minutes of the second reel are in black and white. There are 70 stars in the, and you could be some of the most famous stars at the time, including, including the famous Rin Tin Tin. Uh, live in the movie. The film was also released as a silent film for theaters that weren't equipped for sound and also um, overseas to, to places that were not uh, without sound because there were some European places were not receptive to musical. The film actually marked the end of the career for a number of silent green stars because their voices didn't transfer well to live sound. February 9th of 1930, uh, the theater saw Vagabond Lover with Rudy Valley. This is his first motion picture. And everybody already knew Rudy Valley. They heard him weekly on the radio and singing. He sold record for Victrola. He had sheet music that you could get for the piano. And uh, so finally, actually seeing him live on the screen was a, a big thrill for people in Pensacola an interesting plot, an amateur musician in search of work who impersonates a big band leader. And speaking of the Victrola record, the same week there's an ad in the paper from uh, Randall Music House, and it offered used for sale trade-in Victrolas 
that are reportable and you could just take them with you when you were camping or out to the beach and put on a record and crank it up and, and you would have actual music. Mid-January, this film came called Sally. This is the fourth all sound, all color film ever made, feature film. Um, and uh, it, uh, it retained three of Jerome Kern's song from the original production. This Marilyn Miller that starred in the film, she was actually the lead on the, on the successful Broadway play. And she was hired for the film reportedly at the extravagant sum of $1,000 an hour, and she reportedly earned $100,000 star in the film. For 103 minutes long, the budget for the film was $647,000. It box office receipt for this film totaled $2,198,000. And as you can see, the colors, it's the, again, the two-tone color, and so the red stand out, but other colors are just uh, washed away um, and all. It, this film was actually lost for 60 years. Only, a copy only turned up in the 1990s. It had only survived as a black and white film today. We just have a few copies of what the, uh, what the pieces of, of uh, two-tone color look like. Now, while Technicolor had been using a two-color process. They also were experimenting with the next level called Process 3. And toward the end of February, the Sangers showed the movie The Viking, uh, advertised as entirely in natural color and sound. Now, this film was shown at the Sanger on February 24th. It actually had been produced two years later, and it is considered the first feature-length Technicolor film that featured a soundtrack, and it was first made in Technicolor Process 3. So Pentacola is really seeing the history, the beginnings of color film production through the Sanger Theater. This is one of the cells from the movie. Um, and uh, it, this, this film got some criticism. It's actually one of the last silent movies ever made, and, it, and, uh, and all. And one critic complained that the whiskers of Leif Erikson, the lead character, he had a long curling mustache and American audience preferred their men clean shaven. And the critic claimed that at a time that the screen seemed filled with Viking whiskers. Now coming back to the talkies, as the talkies began to proliferate, the question, there were consternation some of the great actors that the actresses we loved on the screen didn't have voices that would go with their persona. And one of these, of course, was Greta Garbo. And her film opened, Anna Christie opened in April. It was billed all over the country as Garbo Talks. Finally, Garbo Talks. And um, so often after this, a lot of other films are also billed for the first time when you hear someone's voice is, uh, someone talks that you had not heard before, especially a silent film, uh, silent film star. Um, and actually, in the past, within the last five or six years, there was a there was a book came out about Garbo Talk, and also a uh, a book a movie made about that whole issue at the time. Remember, I mentioned earlier that that hundred member cast showed up to do uh, the Vagabond King and that there was a movie in production. Well, in mid-April, it came to the Sanger Theater, first for a midnight preview on April 9th, and then it ran for four days later, four days later at the Sanger. And it is, it is paramount first, 100% all Technicolor, that two-color process I mentioned, all talking picture. And so Paramount were quite proud of it. And I have here a couple of frames of what the color process looks like for that. And of course, the reds, the reds and the very light red stand out, but from the other colors are, are rather, rather muted. And of course, this is Hank Sanger, and you see under its name on the ad, the tagline, the home of Paramount Pictures. At the end of April, Sanger announced a new investment of $100,000 to install air conditioning in the movie theater. It actually had some 
cooling method earlier that I've not been able to figure out yet, but they advertised in 1929 that the theater was never warmer than 70 degrees. But in this time, Paramount, through, through, if they're, uh, through their public theater, they decided to put air conditioning in many of them. And so they did this for the Sanger. Um, and so the newspaper article announced that it would be ready about May 15th and then the, the newspaper ad for the Sanger set around May 20th. But nevertheless, once it was installed, they changed their advertising to the icy and snow covered lettering that they used into the summer months in their ad here at the here in the and and turning and promoting their movie theater the refrigerated Sanger, which is something we certainly need in hot summer months in Pensacola. They didn't off, always use this icy uh, lettering. I, I don't find it some months. I would expect it to be there in like July, for example, but they occasionally used it when they wanted to emphasize the Sanger as a, a place to get away from the Florida heat waves that, that we had. Now, this is a, a photograph uh, ostensibly is supposed to uh, promote the streetcar, but this has a nice one showing what the Sanger marquee looked like. It's undated, but it's certainly probably about 1929, 1930 with the, with the marquee that the Sanger uses in front of it. Now I blew it up and looked at the lettering on the right side and I don't have the, all of the word, but it, at the top line, you can read the word, the party of the star paramount and the bottom of it, you can see all talking, singing, and laughing. And so the Sanger promoting this quite, quite well. In mid-June, uh, the Cuckoos movie came. This starred the comedy team of Wheeler and Wolsey. They were pretty famous for their risque humor and had they were vaudeville and they made a lot of comedy films in the late 1920s and then RKO Radio Picture, full-length comedy feature from 1930 to 1937, some of them using the two-tone color process. But in 1934, the motion picture industry formally adopted the code, what's called the Hayes Code. I'll come back to that in a second. Um, most of their jokes after their code was produced, them a lot of the a lot of the, their uh, risque uh, uh, humor went right out the window. One example I can share from this film: the girl says to Bert, "Can you sing for me?" And there's a popular song at the time called "An Hour with You." Go back to them, "An Hour with You," and so Bert says, "How about an hour with you?" And she says, "Sure, but sing to me first. The, uh, the Hayes Commit Code, all of these movies in, in historical, when you look at their history of them, they all say they're pre-code. Pre-code means that there was no real control over the content of movies prior to 1934, although there's a, some limited kind of thing. But you see in these films things like mild profanity, sexual innuendos, illegal drug use, promiscuity, prostitution, intense violence. The gangsters in these movies when you see them, they don't come off as evil people. They come off as heroes. And that may be our 20s and 30s, why we look at, you know, some of the gangsters as, as more heroes than, than cooks. And the Hayes Code came into being in 1934, often called the Moral Code. But all the 1930 films with the Sanger are, are pre-code. And there's a couple more examples I'll come up with, and I'll, I'll show why that's kind of important. Now, the Sanger, for the most part, showed motion picture, but occasionally they would offer live shows or vaudeville. And so when Maurice Chevalier's new film, The Big Pond, arrived, um, arrived in June, they also had four, uh, what they call four vaudeville acts on the stage, including an acrobatic dancer, a singer, uh, a comedy, uh, a comedian, and others, and so they would do the, they would show the film, do these acts, show the film, and of course, as you can see from the ad, they also had, could see from other things like Laurel and Hardy uh, movie and and other kinds of things. They often showed a Paramount newsreel, which I've not been able to track down yet, but they would show a newsreel from from Paramount. 
in addition to the vaudeville program and the movie, they also had a contest in the newspaper. And the idea was that you would write in what you think Claudette Colbert says in response to Marie Chevalier's little French phrase at the top and send it in. And they offered um, prices being $5 in gold to the first person, $2.50 in gold to the second, and then 10 winners after that, each getting a pair of tickets to the movie. Um, there was a long list of winners and submitters in the paper, and I, I was rather, it was kind of rather daunting to, to, to realize how many people in Pensacola could speak French uh, in 1930. Another contest they would do in the paper uh, for, for July 4th, uh, they had a special patriotic um, matinee and they also showed up the film The Social Lion, but they put this coupon in the paper and to get into the matinee free, you had to have, you had to have uh, noted that you had read the entire Declaration of Independence from beginning to end, or that mother or father had read you the Declaration of Independence, and they had to be signed by the child and their parents, and you could bring that theater uh, to get into the uh, to get into the movie free of charge. July eighth, there was the showing of Bird with Bird at the South Pole, which is a combination of documentary. Um, and a little fic fiction tale. Um, and the Sanger offered a free showing to area Boy Scouts. Um, and they, according to the paper, they lined up and marched from Lee Square uh, down to the Sanger being led by the Scout Drum and Bugle Corps to see this film in July. And you can see the icy letters on the Sanger at the bottom. And they're also showing a bunch of other, bunch of other things, uh, cartoons and all that. Not to be left out, the local merchants were in this ad, Atlantic and Pacific stores, grocery stores. And it says a bad selection of food might have caused the lives of 42 men that dared to venture 2,300 miles beyond the last outpost of civilization. Um, obviously, Bird selected Boker coffee and Quaker made beans. Um, and uh, so I thought that was kind of an, an, a nice, nice local tie-in. In August, one of the most major films issued in 1930 came to the theater, All Quiet on the Western Front. Uh, it is perhaps one of the most violent American film of the time. Uh, it is very, um, it is gory, uh, limbs are being bl uh, blown off. I mean, it is just uh, a true to life, horrible, horrible uh, war story of a young, from, based on a German, German novel, a group of young German re recruits uh, who joined during World War II and followed the war through their eyes, two hours and 32 minutes. It's actually the first film to win, win two Academy Awards one for outstanding produc production and one for best director. Um, I do not know if this film would have made it through the uh, through the code, the Hayes Code at the time, but this was an example of the kind of thing that that the code was trying to uh, really prevent or or stop. The uh, Pennsylvania met the Mark Brothers on film in their late September with their film Animal Cracker. Uh, and I have a little joke from the film up there where Mrs. Rittenhouse, of course, the, the famous Margaret Dumont, says, Captain, this leave me speechless. And Captain Jeffrey Balding being gracious says, well, see that you remain that way. Uh, probably the most famous line in this 99-minute black and white film was Groucho's line, I shot an elephant in my pajamas. Oh, I got in my pajamas. I don't know. October 7th saw the film Wu Be with Eddie Cantor. This is his this is his first film with Eddie Cantor. You could hear him on the radio. This is a comedy musical western film filmed in the two-color technicolor process. This made Eddie Cantor a star. Uh, the film was produced, of course, by uh, Flo Ziegfeld and Samuel uh, Goldwyn. And uh, so again, another star is born the Sanger. 
the local Pensacola and see somebody that they've heard on the radio for several years and they get to see him on the big screen. Now, October 21st, the singer got robbed. Um, and uh, it happened at, during the evening, Sunday, late Sunday evening, October the uh, 20th. And uh, when the uh, crew got to the Sanger, they found the safe had been hammered open. And uh, the uh, robbers had also uh, gone to three other businesses. These weren't normal safe crackers. Crack crackers. These were people that hammered on the safe with hammers and, and all that to try to break through the metal. And they got through two iron doors of the Sanger safe, but could not penetrate the third door behind which was $2,400 in movie receipt from Saturday and Sunday night. And the only thing they got from the Sanger was they stole uh, the manager's pistol, Johnny John gun, and they were, and they found $40 in the coin uh, that change outside of the safe, and they took that. I think what's even more interesting is what happened to the robber after this, and I'll just mention this briefly. Um, so, and and when police investigated, they took fingerprints here and also at two of the other business. They they talked to local witnesses that lived in the area, and they said, oh, they heard a lot of hammering, but they thought renovation was going on. Two days later. Uh, the, the two, they arrested two men. They found them in a room in a quote small local hotel, and they found guns and knives. I found no mention with that they recovered any of the money, but it sounded like they got such small amount that it wasn't worth it. Um, and they were arrested October 22nd. On November 5th, the two robbers that were arrested, plus two other guys, escaped from the county's jail. They sawed through the iron bars with hacksaws. They used soap to cover the sound for the sawing. They lowered themselves 50 feet from the top of the jail uh, to the ground using a blanket and what police called new rope. They were recaptured two days later. One of the robbers and another convict had caught a freight train to Flomerton. They were found in Flomerton. Two of the other guys missed the cars and they, uh, they managed to hide in the back of a truck that was heading up today, US 29, and they were found in the back of a truck heading for Alabama. The sheriff said that the hacksaw and the new rope had obviously been had been brought in by the Sunday visitors uh, to the prisoners uh, the week before. At their trial on November 12th, each one claimed it was the other one who was responsible for the robbery. Jury didn't agree with either of them. They were out for 30 minutes declared them guilty. They got five years each for the uh, Sanger robbery. On November 4th, uh, Amos and Andy's first film, Check and Double Check, appeared at the Sanger. They were already household names. They had daily broadcast on the radio. Everybody knew that they were uh, white men wearing blackface. Um, and uh, every and they just were quite popular. And in conjunction with their appearance, uh, the lobby of the Sanger uh, for, were given given to Reynolds Music House, who displayed the brand new majestic refrigerator. And then they also showed off the latest Radio Victrola, uh, Radio Victrola. Now, what this is, this is a Victrola and a radio. But the Victrola, you could speak into it and record your voice on a record. And so they invited guests to stop in and record their own voice. In early November, again, working with another area merchant, the Elabash Jewelry Company, Elabash announced that, that when you visited the Sanger Theater from November 9th to, to November, end of November, every time you bought a Sanger ticket, you got a ticket that was good for a drawing for a $75 diamond ring, $37.50 bull of a watch, or a $25 birthstone ring. And so you see the ad in the Sanger. Um, uh, uh, noting that the Sanger Elabash prizes were going to be drawn on, on Monday night, December the 1st. I, uh, I did not find a list of winners in the paper, but perhaps given the security of the time and the robbery, you didn't want anyone to know you'd gotten some valuable jewelry. Um, so this was a, a gimme to get people into the theater and working with local merchants. 
In late November, the Sanger working with Agnes McReynolds School PTA offered to start having Saturday matinees for children beginning December 11th with a series on the life of North American Indian. And they also offered a prize contest for poster uh, designed by school children on Indian life. And so December 11th, I'm sorry, December 13th, The Indians Are Coming uh, was shown. It was, a, it was a movie that had 12 chapters. And so Sanger would continue to do this for the rest of December and into 1931. And they also had a program, they also had a circus there in conjunction with it. Um, now the matinee, they asked children to bring material that could be distributed for Christmas among the poor of Pensacola. And in addition, there was a circus. Uh, there, was a, 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 there was dogs and ponies and monkeys and it was built a clean, fresh and thrilling moment. Uh, it was there on the 12th and then also on the 13th for the kitty matinee. Patrons were notified that if they could, had discarded clothing that could be cleaned and given to the poor, if they would give it to the Sanger Valet, it would be cleaned free of charge and then given to social services. Remember, this is an uptown theater. So they have a valet with uh, coat check-in and all of the luxuries of, a, of the major theater. The Sanger finally broke down and announced that there were so many grown-ups who wanted to see the matinee and obviously the doggies and ponies and monkeys uh, that uh, if they brought uh, free clothing, they would also uh, be given to the poor. They would also be uh, given admitted free. This matinee was also sponsored by the uh, Pensacola News Journal. I should mention that uh, be between the performances, there were some other things, songs of performed by children, readings and all that. And then I found a note that there was an address given by Lola Lee Daniel. Now she was a, a, a local uh, teacher, real estate agent, she, pretty important in historical service, circle, circle. And she gave a talk on Indian mounds around Pensacola. And I find that both interesting, but a little horrifying because all the kids came running out after the Indians are coming and knowing where the Indian mounds are looking for arrowheads. So I just kind of wonder, I just wonder why we don't, we don't talk about Indian mounds around Pensacola uh, much anymore. Now, December 20th was the second matinee of the Indians are coming. And here the kitty could also stay and see the doorway to hell. This was a gangster movie. It was Jimmy Cagney's second movie. It was full of blood and gore and shoot ups and killing and fights. It one of the it also set the tone for gangster films into the future. It was one of the first film to where you hide hid the Tommy gun inside the violin cave and all that. The Indian for Coming is a pre-code universal movie based on the Great West that was a book by William Buffalo Cody. And it was the first all talking, complete sound movie film of its kind, 12 chapters. Um, and it's actually responsible for reviving the interest in this serial series, which were actually seen to be dying uh, at the end of the silent, uh, at the silent age. Now, continuing to work with the community, the Sanger sponsored another benefit on December 23rd and repeated it on December the 24th, which featured local talent of readers, performers, dancers, and others, built a 10 vaudeville acts um, and, and in association with the movie. And they, Sanger promised 25% of the growth to the five major charities in Pensacola. And these included like the Salvation Army, social services, and, and some other from other organizations that were responsible for the distrib distributing food baskets, food, clothing, and other things to the poor at Christmas time. Christmas Day, the Sanger was showing this film, Just Imagine. And what it is, it's an interesting plot. It's a man who, uh, who goes to sleep in 1930 and wakes up in the year 1980. The Rip Van Winkle of 1980. And if you look at the fine print, it's got John Garrick, Marino, Herrick, Sullivan in it. But if you look at the fine print, it says, uh, 
petting parties, an airplane parked in the sky, aerial cop patrolling, love nest on the 325th floor, the state choosing your sweetie, and so forth. So this was really a, an interesting advertising to get you to come and see this uh, Rip Van Winkle movie. Um, but then that movie was still showing when the next kitty matinee came along on December 27th. And so the kid got to go visit the kitty matinee and see the uh, added attractions and speakers and cartoons and prizes. And then also see the movie about, uh, you know, petting, petting in the planes on uh, the sky and, and love nest on the 325th floor. Obviously an interesting pre-code <laughs> movie of the Sanger. And then finally, the Sanger ended in 1931 with special New Year's Eve with a film called Sin Takes a Holiday, which was described as a sophisticated drama with spicy dialogue. What I think is important about the Sanger in 1930, it's it bringing Pensacolians, uh, making them a little more social aware because of the kinds of films that are coming out. They're actually now beginning to hear and see people that they've heard on the radio for years. Uh, certainly the travelogues are bringing them news about the world with sound and other features. And also uh, the Sanger is obviously the center of culture in Pensacola. Uh, if not, doesn't have vaudeville all the time, but the vaudeville acts are, are fairly clean. They're fairly decent. Um, there are other movie theaters operating. The Isis and the Benita are operating. They're also running film. They're getting a lot of their film from some of the other studios. Sometimes they're running the, they get second runs of the film uh, weeks and months after the Sanger first, first ran it. But the films in Pensacola and the Sanger in 1930 was a place to get away from the uh, consternations of the time, the issues of the day, and certainly it was cool inside during Pensacola's hot tropical time. So I thank you today for coming and hearing a glimpse of what theater life was like at the Sanger Theater in Pensacola in 1930. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Dean, any idea when the last, when the Sanger last regularly had motion pictures? Uh, I can't answer that. I don't know that. I don't know that one. Okay, thanks. Um, I mean, I, th I think that's the last, next thing on my, I think that's the, probably the next thing on my research, kind of moving it into the, into the, into the 1960s and 70s. Right. Um, and I do have a picture of what the marquee looked like uh, in the 19, probably the early 1960s. Um, mm -hmm. It changed kind of, it changed a little bit, um, but uh, some pictures of, of it are, are kind of hard to, hard to, to locate. Thank you. Sure.